Welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. And I'm George. And George, I have to assume that you opened the box because we came. Technically, uh, my wife opened the she box for open me. The box, yeah. Well, that, in, in playing the theme of the movie, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Did she watch the movie? Absolutely Hell not. no. <laughs> oh, well, then I guess we still have... Uh, we still have such sights to show sights her. Sights to show, right. right. Mm. Yes. Nice. <laughs> hmm. uh, George, what movie did you watch tonight? Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Which one? Did you watch uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, <laughs> 5, 6, 7, 12, 14? There's a lot one of them. that counts. There's only one that counts. Uh, whichever one you told Megan to put on. Okay. I Good. hope you watched the right one. I do. <laughs> I do this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> Amazon Prime was not being helpful because it listed mm. it as a 2019 movie. What? The original? Yeah. Thanks, Amazon. Wow. They but suck. anyway. Wait, are they sponsor? No, they're not. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. We had them for a week and then we lost them. Duh. Womp. Womp, womp, womp. So, George, Hellraiser, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, before we get too far into the <laughs> plot of this movie, because it is, uh, I mean, is there a plot to this movie? Let's not get into it yet. I need to get an update from George, because his first impression when we talked about this movie last week was that he was going to be seeing some muscly dudes with leather jackets and machine guns. <laughs> okay. Right. You should take <laughs> the clip from the last one and just play it here so that, like, if somebody doesn't listen to the last episode, right, right, they'll right, right. they'll still hear it. It's ridiculous. Okay, it, well, it here, shows. We'll it drop shows, that clip in right. Drop that here. Here. Our next event: Clive Barker's Hellraiser. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Do you okay. know? Do you know who Clive Barker is? No. Do you know who Hellraiser is? No. Does anything spring to mind? Visually, I yeah. When you say Hellraiser, I I see like I see big guns, and I see like uh like a black trench coat, kind of like badass kind of guy, but also like kind of Matrixy maybe. Okay, like that kind of thing. I think, but I I think he's kind of got the right idea. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear am me I, smiling? Am I way off? <laughs> that was almost as epic as the I I ain't seen Rocky, <laughs> where we both went. Wait a minute. That's wait, good. Wait. That's good. I so then I had the yes. the the worst. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, we should oh. do this more often, yeah. guys. It's That's a vigilante fun. movie about a guy in a trench coat. <laughs> I mean, you're uh, ready for it. Let's just put it in right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he figured half of it out already. Oh. Shit. He's getting mm. good at this. He's getting real good. <laughs> 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 oh, shoot. Uh, on that note. Yeah. On a li- dude, mm. a lot, dude, a lot of times... <laughs> You're like, what do you expect from this movie? And like, I just have no idea. That's, I mean, I just like that you I, had some I, idea. It's about gold. It. it was great. Yeah, I expect some hell and some raisin. <laughs> no, but like, what was it? What did I see like recently? It had like, uh, it had a Han Solo in it, uh, but it wasn't a Star Wars movie. What's like that? Indiana name? Jones, like Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford, but it was a, uh, it was like a futuristic like robots in space yeah blade runner dude that movie was nothing at all like i thought it would be right. nothing and i thought like i was like oh yeah blade runner i know what blade runner is all about i did not I had no idea i did not Some so, say that's that happens in the same... a lot dude yeah you guys good. are like yeah hey, with this title and i'm like oh yeah i think i know about that i don't mm, like first blood zero <laughs> yeah exactly first blood i don't know i think we ought to do the first blood know. procedure again so don't look at the DVD, <laughs> don't look at the case, have your wife put it in, hit start, and then you watch the movie. Okay, we'll do. And hopefully she leaves the room. Such a good, op- <laughs> such a good opening, too, so that's good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this. Oh, gosh. Very good. Now you know why we were laughing when you were saying 
this demonstrates <laughs> how much I know about movies. Right. Nothing. I even know less than nothing because I think I know things that are wrong. And that's why we need not even this, not even close and, and with confidence. Like you were like, oh, it's clearly about no, this. no, no, no. <laughs> I wasn't confident at all. I told you that I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think it's like a no, no. I was thinking like a Mad Max type thing, mm. or it's like I don't know, something like that. I really started to get <sighs> the impression, and it was a during the the first fall break when we were going through all the Jason episodes about Friday the Thirteenth Part Six. <laughs> George started to get confident that he knew anything about mm. movies. And we've been kind of dealing with that ever since. And so I think this is a good reminder that George has now seen 47 movies. That's where we're at, 47? I know maybe, nothing, guys. And I maybe still George will nothing. remember this next week <laughs> when we watch a <laughs> movie that George has now seen 47 movies. Holy God. What was funny is he knew so well the movies that he actually gave away the plot <laughs> of a movie four movies ahead. <laughs> Are you talking about Jason? Yeah, yeah I didn't I did. even know it. He's just like, well, what the hell's next? You know, they're going to jump from body to body. But we're like, ah. Was it just going to be like a mania that jumps from person a to mania? person? No, that's what I said it yeah. should be. Oh, my God. It was so funny. I can't believe I said that. And oh, my God. The Dan and Posts were so good. appearances of Dan and Post. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Those episodes are evergreen, man. They're going to last forever. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I yeah, mean, like in our top post. five each month, for some reason, <laughs> two or three of those sneak in every month. People love Jason. <laughs> I get it. Now, George, this movie comes out in 1987. What else came That's out? That's in- terrible. Well, oh my god, which oh, Friday terrible. the Thirteenth are we up to at this point, George? Um, Friday the Thirteenth Part. I have no idea. Seven, actually. Hmm. Think Which back. one was seven? Was that New York? No, that's no, seven was the Carrie. Uh, the Carrie ripoff. The uh, the psychic girl. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the think about came, all came. the supernatural elements of that movie, where you've got zombie Jason with his ribs poking out the back of his back, fighting mm-hmm. in a pond, getting electrocuted by a telekinetic, mm-hmm. and then through a staircase and then ripped. I mean, horror in America at this time, it's here, man. Like it is supernatural. It is weird. It's got a little Beetlejuice in it, right? Hellraiser is just horny Beetlejuice. That's all it is. <laughs> but I think in uh, Clive Barker's defense, the book probably had all these elements in it, and I don't know how old the book is. Uh, Hellraiser's based on one of his books. I mean, people have been having sex for a while. No, I'm talking about like the he was bringing up uh, part seven and the supernatural, what was going on in horror, oh, the horror at the time, where they were gotcha. kind of mixing supernatural with, with their horror. Not the horny part. Not the, the horny part. part. That's always gotcha. there. Yeah. You do get a lot of uh, answers in the second one. Okay. But we're not watching it, although I like the second one. Yeah, second Probably one's pretty more, good. I like the second one more than this one, actually. Okay. I could see that. Yeah. Now, another thing you've not experienced yet, George, uh, and this is a pretty good example of it. Uh, this movie is not a narratively strong movie. This is an experiential movie, right? Mm. This one, if you get hung up on where are the character arcs and what is the plot of this movie exactly and who is my protagonist, <laughs> stuff mm-hmm. like that, standard movie stuff. If you get hung up on that, you're going to be held back from enjoying the movie because that's not what they're going for here. You know, they're going for a haunted house, you know, Halloween frights kind of situation where you get thrust into this horrifying situation and you see really gross, scary stuff for an hour and a half. I think that is my hang up. Or like, yeah. Because first, you know, first, you know, first watch, I'm kind of like... I just like throw my hands up like I don't know. The only thing that makes me throw my hands up the first time I watched it and today because it never does get addressed. The man at the end. The, oh, that's the, the, the only that's the only thing. Yeah. No, I, he it, made it uh, 89 <laughs> minutes in before he was me. like, what? <laughs> but I mean, they, they kind of imply that there's this devil character that is kind of watching over this box Mm -hmm. and, you know, keeps it in circulation because once you use the box and you're taken, 
that box just sits there. Does so, it? Uh, I don't know. I'm assuming that's what How'd happens. How'd the box end up in that house? Uh, With Frank. Frank it, it got was, it from it, the Middle East. The pinhead Cenobite, when they come in and find the room with mm-hmm. Frank's body all over the place, he picks up the box. So that's not answered because Pinhead picks up the box, sets the room back to the way it was by closing the portal. Mm-hmm. Where does the box go? Does he leave it in the room? Because then for some reason Frank has the box again. So that's right. never answered. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's That was my question. Right. But then this bum that's walking around in the pet store and whatever... And at the end becomes that skeletal dragon thing and flies off with the box, which ends up back in, I don't know if it was like Taiwan or wherever, somewhere in Asia. Some Asian desert. Uh, Looked like Tatooine. <laughs> no, not that part. When, at the, the table where he gives... Yeah, that looks like Tatooine. It does, does look it? like Tatooine. Yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. that this uh, dragon pterodactyl skeleton thing is actually what inspired... Amazon to want to do drone delivery, so I'm I'm here for it. Like, bring on I'm the there. drones, man. Yeah, I mean, the, the second movie kind of touches on the labyrinth of of the the realm that the Cenobites come from, and also it's it's very hell like. Mm-hmm. But it's almost like a. It's more like mazes, and it's like a labyrinth. They never explain what version of hell that is. So yeah, that's confusing too because you don't know. But you do you do see Frank in hell in the second one, and he's you could see his personal hell, and he he basically explains to you what his personal hell is, and his personal hell is his obsession with sex and not being able to attain it. Like it's always in front of him, it's always there tempting him. But as soon as he pulls the sheet back of the naked woman under the sheet, pulls the sheet back, she's not there. Like it's just constant torture. Mm. for him it's actually it's it's it, i want you to watch it but because it, it kind of explains things the second one but yeah but like dan's saying it, it's it's a total it's a visual thing it's not a lot of depth like mm. i think it was it the was visuals a, it, weren't that it, good either it's a well for the time it was i mean no that's why when you said 1987 i was like what the hey, like before i was we thinking trash i was the... watching these effects I don't even care who was in charge of these effects. I was watching them, and I was thinking, "Oh, this movie must be from the seventies." The digital stuff, the like the the lightning bolts and all that stuff, terrible. But the the practical is not too bad. Pra- no, I was actually thinking the practical was bad. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, man. Like when uh, what's uh, what's what's the girl's name? The young girl. Uh, Kirsty. Kirsty. When she opens the box, and that thing's coming down the hallway. Yes. At her. I can see the cart it's rolling on. Yes, you can. Uh, it's the, like, the, the, again. It's unacceptable. It's something, and I, I, I knew you were going to say this, it's something that is going to happen with these VHS type movies when they get cleaned up and put <sighs> on high def. Oh my God. A lot of the <laughs> stuff that was, yeah, like you know how Dan says, oh, you see all these things in 4K? Like that's the kind of stuff that they tried to hide. <laughs> Back then, yeah, obviously, in the shadows. But even if I didn't see the cart, like you can tell, it's just a rolling thing. I yeah. mean, to be fair, I'm pretty sure I saw the crew moving around behind that lit up brick wall at one point. I'm just like, oh mm. no, that was a crew member. Like, oh, probably did, yeah. And that's fine because you know what? They're going for it. Like, this is a movie that is not holding back, and they're gonna risk you seeing the cart so that you can have that giant thing come running at you right. in a nightmare. Like, visual nightmare is what this movie is. That is that is true. I thought that. I thought that this movie is going for it, but the, so the hard. Not there. And yeah, yeah, they're not. Yeah, it's just not I agree. possible yet. But what's fun? What's ironic is the older the franchise gets, it it doesn't benefit from the new technology because the stories get worse. Yeah, <laughs> that sucks. And the characters get worse. <laughs> so it's like. They had all this really cool universe they were building in one and two, and two the effects are way better than yeah. than one. Uh, still, there's some '80s type hinky things in there, but when you watch Basket Case or something, you'll realize that this is like Oscar award winning compared to movies like Basket Case and Critters, and like the '80s were big on fuck it, let's just do it. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> you know, can, oh, yeah. who cares if the hand puppet? It looks cool. 
Let's just do it. So I, I, I give them a little bit of leeway. But again, I've complained about things like, like Day of the Dead where it's like this doesn't work, this doesn't look right. But they were they were basically saying, Hey, it's a bright room, it's daytime, and we're making this shit blue. With this, they're like, Okay, we know that looks like crap just like Jaws. We know that looks like crap, so we're gonna fix it in editing. We know that looks like crap, so we're gonna fix it with darkness. Dawn didn't do that. Dawn was just like, F you, we're putting on the fluorescent bulbs and we're doing it. We're right. doing it live. Oh man, we're talking about Dawn of the Dead again. Negatively, but what I'm saying Ugh. is, I I complained about the effects Ugh. in that movie, but I'm I'm a little bit more lenient with this because they weren't putting it in daylight. They were trying to hide the mistakes we saw. What year? With darkness. What year was American Werewolf? Eighty one. This movie came out years after. Mm-hmm. And how was the werewolf transformation better? It's Rick Baker. Money. <laughs> Talent. It's Rick Baker. Okay. But even, okay. Even so it was possible to have a good transformation five years before, mm-hmm. but this movie still didn't have one. Yeah. I think this suffers, like you're saying, budget. Oh, and whatever. so bad, man. Yeah. Like when his arms come out of the floor, and yeah. you're like, what is that? Is that a spider? Is that a, like what? It was a body building like, itself up from the inside. Now, see, oh, God, you, so George, bad. as a person who's never seen movies until the 2020s, Mm. Look at that scene and go, oh my god! Yeah, it's just back that then it was like it's just head crab on a remote control car again and again and again. And Travis <laughs> and I look at that as like, damn, the ambition to build a body yeah. backwards using clay, like they and pull it off, mel- melting wax. Like they what they would do is they would build the body know, and then that. put the wax on and then they'd melt play it the play film backwards. Yes, yeah. I got it. I think so yeah, it's I like, could I could tell by watching it. It's it, it is it's innovative, but obviously. 30, 40 years later, 30 years later. Yeah. It uh, doesn't hold up, but the character, the, the Cenobites hold up, but the effects do not. Uh, some of them do. Some of them do. Pinhead is awesome, but he's just, he's just makeup, basically. Yeah. And he's great. And uh, the chick with the, the throat that's opened up or whatever, awesome. Mm-hmm. Great. Um. I even like Chatter. The Butterball I was not a fan of. The the, the Chatter heavy. is that was what was the it? one with the teeth. Yeah. Chatter, yeah. Okay. Not the But anatomically not not correct. Like the face is twisted and pulled, but it just doesn't look like a human like I, yeah, I never I was... it bothered me that it was the the it just looked like a monster, not a person turned into a monster. I that always bothered me. Yeah. The ones that look the most like people are the best ones. Right. The like even the most scary because they look good. Right. You know? Um, the guy wearing the sunglasses looks like he's from Blues Brothers. <laughs> I was like, okay, right. this guy. And then the guy on the cart. Yeah, it was bad. I didn't like <sighs> that back then. The the demon in the in the hallway. But Pinhead was so good. Yeah. Which is why we made you watch it, because it's iconic and he's gonna be at the show. Yeah, you're gonna. Oh, is he? You're gonna meet Pinhead this weekend. That's why yes! we made you watch this. Yeah, he's gonna be yes! at the show. So we were like, "Do we do it now?" That's because, awesome. Yeah. So that way you get to experience him as a fan of movies. Maybe not a fan of this movie, but. Uh, well, I'm a fan of his. Okay, then, then it was worth it. I was. I mean, because in the end, this movie does not hold up. But if you watched it back then, you watch it all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's that kind of, it's that kind of thing where you just like, it's so nostalgic, and yeah. it's so iconic. Who cares if it's good? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's. But I some, still think it's there's it's something to be said for not a bad movie. There's something to be said for m- nostalgia, right? Right. It's nostalgia is not something that's just throw away. Like, it's important. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, and it's it, it's very important when it comes to this kind of stuff. Especially the char- that character, like walking into a West Coast video or an Errol's and going to the horror section, which we all do, and seeing him on the front cover, you're like, I, I have to watch that. Mom, can I have this? No? All right. How do I fit it in I'm my pocket? Gonna yeah, I'm going to figure out a yeah, way I'm to watch this. find a way to watch this. And that's the way it was back then. Like those kind of movies, you were just like, I have to see it. I don't care if I'm told no a hundred times. I'm going to figure out a way 
get somebody's older brother to rent it. Something. We're going to watch this movie. When I saw Pinhead for the first time, I had like a Rambo moment. Hmm. Like, oh, this is a Rambo movie. <laughs> I was like, oh, this, this is, is the movie pinhead. with that pinhead guy. <laughs> I mean, I've seen him everywhere. He's right. in your house. He's in Ron's basement. He's mm-hmm. like, you know, he's just pinheads everywhere. You see like, you know, you know, it's a, you, if you have a... He's the uh, Mount Rushmore. If you have a Dracula and you have a... Frankenstein? Yeah, you got a ja- Dracula, you got a Frankenstein, you got a, a swamp creature. And you got Pinhead. Right. Right? He's everywhere. I never, I mean, when I saw him, I was like, oh, it's that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why we Why didn't wanted... you just, why didn't you just say so? That's why we wanted <laughs> your wife to start the movie for you so you wouldn't because realize the... what you were getting into. The leather jacket motorcycle guy was so much better. Oh my God. <laughs> no, not at all. And what's cool is in the second one, they give you a backstory on him as well. So you, you learn a lot more about why he's the way he is. I don't know if I really care. Yeah, I I almost, now that I'm thinking about it more, I don't know that I want to watch 2 again anytime soon because I think it answers questions that don't need to be answered. Okay. You know, this one, it doesn't ask a lot of questions. It just presents things for you to wonder about, you know? And it's one of those things that kind of like Silence of the Lambs and the Jamie Gum thing. Like, when you start to try to fill in these backstories, Yes, they it all fits, right? Like, you've got enough room to move that it can all make a nice narrative. But it also, like, negates the character in some ways by making it no longer a mystery. Right. So never mind. Don't watch Hellraiser 2. Mm. Just stick with this one. Watch it again next week and in the week after that. And... I'll just say the the Frank in the second one is better because you get to see him in his element. And the Julia character is really way better than Frank was in the first one. Oh, she steals the show. She's like, she's the first. I she- think I'm definitely going to watch too. At some point. Definitely. Probably soon. Probably before this weekend. Now, I'm going to counter your point about nostalgia, George, uh, because I hadn't actually ever watched the movie until like a year ago. Hmm. I'd okay. always known about it, but yeah, S&M stuff doesn't really like draw me in and pinheads sure don't really make me rent things from the video store. So I just didn't ever bother. I, I always knew it was around, but mm. I finally grabbed one when Arrow put out their edition last year. And, you know, it's fine. Uh, in 4K? No, it's uh, mm. it's only a Blu-ray. Only a Blu-ray. But I will say... <laughs> so you, you saw the cartwheels. <laughs> I did see some cartwheels, and I did yeah. see some crew members. But as a fan of people like Mario Bava, who did this when this was the style of all effects... Mm. you know, in the 60s and in the early 70s. Like, as a fan of those movies, it's nice to see old school tactics applied yes. later. Well, that, that creature in the hallway reminded me a lot of that boy creature in, what was the movie you made us watch with the, the maggots in the pool? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of yeah. has the same face as Phenomena. Yeah, so Phenomena. I had a lot of Phenomena when watching this movie because I didn't have that reference too. before. And there's maggots too, like a yeah. heavy load of maggots at one point. A lot of them, yeah. And I remember the Fangoria magazines when this movie came out, like they played up those shots of the the life sucked bodies, and mm. in stills they looked great. But yeah, that that hallway creature and and the uh, <laughs> the guy coming out of the floor. But again, just like when you watch when you have somebody watch the original King Kong, and they say, "Oh, it looks so stupid, and so fake, and it's, look how jerky it is," blah blah blah, and you're like thinking, "Okay, that was cutting edge that day, right?" Where yeah that it didn't get any better than that. And if my kids laugh at King Kong versus Godzilla in the zip up suits, I don't see. I, and I'm like, that's what we you know, had. You know what it is? <laughs> you know what it is? Had. I was so blown away by the werewolf transformation mm-hmm. when his hand, his normal human hand turns into like a paw, like mm-hmm. a long paw. It stretches and the skin looks real. Yep. And I'm like, Holy God. And then I compare it to this, which is like, it zooms in on his wrist and his hands, like when his fingers start to like Mm -hmm. sprout out from his hand. And I'm like, why is this hand important? It's not. It's just something like, it's just, this is the effect that we're going to show you for Mm -hmm. the hell of showing it to you. And it wasn't even good. Right. You could say that about the entire movie though, is this is what we're going to show you. And if George doesn't like it, then it wasn't that great. Right. 
But yeah, because I've always had a problem with when the hooks go in the skin. In the beginning, the skin looked like brownies. Like it was well, just in like, the beginning, it did. At the end, though, it looked better. It it did look good yeah. because it was actually it like you actually saw it attached to his hand. But I mean, just the consistency, like when she scratches his face and well, leaves the claw marks, like I'm it's wondering, just like jelly. I'm wondering, okay, is that again more questions? But like, I guess you're meant to assume that they took his skin off. Yeah, he skinned his brother. Put it on him. Put it on his face. Okay, very Hannibal and, Lecter. Yes. Right. So they didn't just suck the life out of him, and he grew new skin because right. then he would look like Frank. Right. Right. Okay. So I assumed that correctly, but um. But yeah, what does skin that's not yours look like when it gets scratched? Probably like that, I think. No, that, yeah, but I'm just saying the, the effect for the time looked great, but now when you look at it, you've seen college students do better with the blending and the... I mean, shout out to our listener Haven and that insane Hannibal Lecter makeup. Yeah, but I, what I was what I was saying was that I didn't really care that it wasn't blended well because it wasn't his skin it wasn't even right. it was just like slapped on him so I'm just trying to be consistent when I, if i if i was breaking <laughs> day that that you know dawn's balls i'm gonna break their balls too yeah i Ugh. no that i didn't care about because like i said i thought it was like a slapped on skin and when it's slapped on skin gets scratched i don't know what the hell it looks like probably like that well, like when we talked about frank's personal hell my personal hell is listening to you guys diss on dawn of the dead have you ever seen men in black i uh, parts of it yes okay so you know about the character who's basically a bug wearing a person as a suit. Yes. Right? That is what they probably wanted to achieve. Yes. But they just were not technologically there and or even had the knowledge to do what Rick Baker did with Edgar and that suit hanging off his face. Like that's what, it, that's what Frank as his brother should have looked like. But... That was 1997, so that's 10 years later. And, again, Rick Baker. But then Rick Baker had, had his flops, too, like when he did King Kong. He did a man in a monkey suit, and it does not hold up. It didn't hold up then, and it doesn't hold up now. So it's like even the greatest ones have... Don't say anything negative about Rick Baker. <sighs> well, believe me, I love him. He's the man. And I love the remake do, of King he Kong. He can do no wrong. But that monkey suit, though. <laughs> so, and he did that, what, 74, I think? So that was 10 years prior to... I like the remake remake of King Kong. And you should. It's a really great movie. But you look at like something like Mighty Joe Young, the remake of Mighty Joe Young, had the practical gorilla, the animatronic gorilla, not the CGI gorilla. Mm. So I usually take that more give that more respect because it's a, an actual, they built that yeah. and it worked as opposed to CGI. So if Edgar in, in Men in Black was all CGI, it wouldn't have looked as good. Question. This doesn't just go for movies. This goes for anything. If you use a more difficult method, does it make the product more respectable? Maybe not the product, but the creators, I think. In my mind. Like, if they go the hard route and they make it look damn good, mm -hmm. or you take the easy way. Prime example, the the, <laughs> the 2018 The Thing. Mm -hmm. There's a meme on, on uh, the internet that shows what the practical effects look like, and then what the end result was because the studio stepped in and said, you have to do this, 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 all CGI. So you can look at the practical effects and see that's way better. And they took the time to build and build molds and pour them and paint them and make latex and foam latex and silicone. Hours, man hours, crazy. And then the one guy, two guys, three guys that sit and do the computer generation and it looks terrible because they rushed it because the studio said so. Yeah. I respect the practical effects guys more because they basically did the harder job with better results than the easy way out. Well, and George, you and I have been known to discuss guitar-related issues, right? We have. We have. What's a guitar? And so when you talk about people that build one guitar at a time by hand, mm -hmm. there are going to be human factor errors, right? 
inconsistencies from one guitar to the sure. next. Sure. Same with yep. amplifiers, especially built old school point to point wiring like the Westworld yep. robots. Mm. Guitar pedals mm-hmm. the same way, right? Zombies. To a certain crowd, those are going to be the better item, even if they are flawed, because they do have performance potential that a machine built product doesn't have. But it divides your audience a little bit because some guitar players want a guitar or an amp or a pedal that is exactly the same as the one next to it as made by the machine. Mm-hmm. That's your CGI. Yeah, I'm you know what I was I was thinking as like a counterpoint to that. Do you remember back when guitar effects were digital for oh. a minute? Oh, I do. Like <laughs> Digitech and like all these companies, I guess it was in like the early 2000s, like everything was going digital and it sounded like garbage. Oh yeah, our first demo in high school was like way too much digital flanger. Like way okay. too much. So we've gotten to the point with movies where the CGI kicks the pants off of the practical stuff. We're in Generally. The, the Helix era of CGI? If it's done right. Depending well, on no, the studio, Well, no, no, right? this, is, this is what I'm going to compare yeah. it to. So... The studio CGI is better than practical ever could be at this point. It wasn't back then. It was still in its infancy. But yeah. it's gotten to the point where yeah, I mean, you, you really can can't compete with it. watch a movie made this year where the CGI looks like shit right. and the practical looks great. Right. It just depends on who's doing the CGI. So now we're getting to a point with digital guitar effects, let's say. Mm-hmm. Let's call it the Kemper Age, Right. Of guitar effects, where now the digital is maybe better than the thing that takes a human to make. It should be noted that this is not the official stance of the Remedial Film Class <laughs> podcast. I'm asking a question. I'm so what I'm saying is, if the product, the end product, is good, does the process really matter? I would have to say here at this exact point in the conversation, that we need to be mindful of relative, like time relative perspective. Because Absolutely. I think there were people 12 years ago who had a little pod from line six and were like, we have reached the age where digital is better than what the humans can make, right? Just as mm-hmm. in the late 90s, we we're like, oh man, CGI is about to be the best thing. And then the Matrix comes out and we're like, CGI mm. is everything. And then we start seeing like the blood splatters in CGI and realize, oh, mm-hmm. this looks like shit. Now that we've like but seen now enough when they of do it. the like most headshots and head cuts and stuff on Walking Dead are all digital and they look fine because they're the technology is there to do what took ten hours in like I was gonna a, say a minute. I, I thought that you were gonna say that practical in some ways is still better. Well, there and, are there are cases. Dawn of the Dead, the remake, which you may at some point see, uh, has a lot of practical headshots that look great, and uh, they're going to look great 20 years from now because they're practical, whereas the CGI headshots on Walking Dead right now might look great, Mm -hmm. but in 2030, once we've seen 10 more years of progress on CGI headshots, that is true. you're going to look at it and go, ooh, man, that looked good at the time, but ooh. The, is, o- the only thing that does not fall into that is Jurassic Park. You can watch that today, and still, that movie's over 25 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old. You can watch that and still struggle to see which part is CGI and which part is practical. For the that's most part, sweet. yes. There For are a the couple of part. scenes yeah. where you're like, ooh, that's a low risk well, yeah, texture like on the, the side the, of the brontosaurus. Like, yeah, you yes, can... Yes, yes. But I'm talking like, like the T-Rex. There's oh, a lot the of parts of the T-Rex so where... It's seamless uh, between those two things. Yeah. So, but then I can sit you down. That was 1993. We could sit down and watch Alien 3, where the practical alien looks amazeballs and the, the CGI alien looks terrible. Then you could go to, like you said, American Werewolf in London, which was 82. The sequel, American Werewolf in Paris, the entire werewolf was all CGI and it looked like dog shit. So you can watch Bram Stoker's Dracula and see the practical, and it looks amazing. But then watch uh, Van Helsing, and the CGI vampires and werewolves look like dog shit. So it's like, 
Yeah. It, it, like you said, it's it's time rel- it's relative to what yeah. time period it is. I guess the reason why I brought it up was because you were comparing two movies that came out pretty much the same pretty time. much the same time, Mighty Joe Young and the remake remake. Yes, they came King out the same time. Yeah, they came out the same time. And one used a, a, a CGI gorilla and the other one was practical. Actually, no. I think they were like uh, a few years apart. They were supposed yeah, to come out the same Mido time. Yeah, I thought Mighty Joe Young came out a little Yeah, earlier. it came out like 97 and and Kong came out in 2000. So that was almost 10 years. Okay. Yeah, it's a big difference. But what I, what I was saying was the when you look at the practical gorilla, they could have done a CGI, but back then you would have seen the difference. But yeah, the you, CGI gorilla been, then wouldn't have been as good as the right. practical. But if you watch Planet of the Apes right now, if they put any practical in there, which I don't think there is any, it's all motion cap. Mm-hmm. There's they did it so well that the the CGI motion cap looks like it could be practical. That's how good. Now when they're talking, you know what that moving. reminds me of? It reminds me of um, Lord of the Rings. That that character, that my precious character. Yeah, the Gollum. Yeah, it was like it was CGI, but it was done that way so mm-hmm. with like with a real actor, and like it was like the first CGI where you could actually read its lips because they were real lips, right? You know, kind of thing. But if you watch that today, it looks kind of mm. does it? I haven't seen it in a it, long time. It 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 has dated. When you watch Planet of the Apes, you can see the difference between. Gollum, that ten year difference yeah. or eight year difference, it made a, a huge difference. Yeah, but you know, I it's for, it's forgivable in some movies and it's forgivable not forgivable in others. So I I kind of take it on a movie by movie basis. If it's all lazy, then I, it's not. Yeah, if it's lazy, it's but if lazy. it's just something here or there, like you're saying, ten people are doing this job, someone's work isn't as good as another person's work. Like I know with the King Kong remake. I personally know somebody who worked on the CGI of that movie. His sole job for seven months was animating that stupid centipede that came in and walked in <laughs> on her face and went down her back. That was his sole job. There was a staff of like 150 CGI guys. Yeah. And his job in a three and a half hour movie was to do that centipede. Who did the, the phalluses with teeth that like suck your head in? I want to meet that guy. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That was pretty good. I think his name was Pinhead. <laughs> hey oh. Hey oh. <laughs> you know what I kept coming back to watching it tonight was poor George and poor Travis avoiding that Ouija board at the farmer's market because they're afraid they're gonna get sucked into a portal. And I thought, man, every time one of them fingers that little circle at the top of that puzzle box, I bet George is getting the willies. I definitely was. Definitely. If I see one of those puzzle boxes at a flea market, I'm not picking that shit up either. <laughs> no. <laughs> it could well, sit right next to the Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> and so the couch they, it's sitting on, I'm not buying that either. So going back to uh, the guitar gear question there, George, if you yeah. were to happen across a guitar pedal shaped sort of like a puzzle box, but which sounded like a really good rat, would you step on it and play some songs through it? Or would you be afraid that it might bring you into the world of carnal delights and and metal hardware stretchy stretch. Are you talking about the pedal that Byron made for you? That specific that looks like pedal a puzzle box? That looks is like that, a puzzle box? But sounds is like that a rat? from this movie? Yeah, man. That's what this is from. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool art. Out, out of everything I've seen from Byron, that puzzle box art is really cool. I would step on it. Ooh. What it about you, Travis? Would recommend, would step on it. I'm going to blow your mind, Dan. I own one of those puzzle boxes. What? What? It's in my house. Get rid of it. Oh, but it's no. Just, <laughs> it's just plastic, and it does not open. I mean, maybe but, you just haven't fingered the circle part right. <laughs> I fingered it a lot, and don't, nothing happened. Don't, <laughs> let, your, <laughs> no, don't let your kids touch it. Honestly, oh my it's, gosh. It's, a, it's, a, it's a treasured piece of uh, history because... I took that box to Chiller Theater in like 1997 and met Doug Bradley and he held that box and I took a picture of him holding that box. Did he hold it so, down by his dick like on the cover of the movie or no. was it more up by... No, it was, he was up around his chest. For some reason, the arrow cover art, the hand-drawn one, <laughs> it's just like he's got a big like light bulb going off on his dong. It's very... Got my dick in a box. Oh, man. <laughs> Him and Timberlake. Oh, jeez. <laughs> now, there's your remake, potentially. Oh, Timberlake yeah. is 
is Pinhead. Yeah. <laughs> Take it on down to Omniville. Yeah, I don't know. That would be a different movie, I think. So, yeah, I do own one of those boxes. Hypocrite. <laughs> it's, it's not a working box. Yeah, that's what she said. Any Ouija board is a working box. Uh, <laughs> in my mind. You can, you can have one if you want. No. <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I do find it interesting in this movie that Pinhead and the Cenobites are basically the iconic bad guys for these movies, but at no point are they ever bad guys. I mean, they torture F that guy to death at the beginning of the yeah, movie. Yeah, but you you asked for it. It's it's that's that's what you isn't that you a bit of a them bait and switch that. though? Like, no, I don't know. <laughs> He's like, yeah, the a F, little bit. The and F then part, also, yeah, but the ouch. <laughs> also, like, what's her name? Kirsty? I, I, Kirsty. Kirsty, whatever. She's like, oh, I did it by accident. And they were like, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> You're so they're, they're kind of bad, you know? Yeah, well, they're demons. But I'm just saying. Are like, they? They said they could be angels or demons. demons are, yeah, demons to some, angels to others. Yeah. But they clearly are from. What do they say? They don't say interdimensional. They say something else. But, yeah. I don't know. I, I it's the first time watching this where I actually thought that I was like, oh wow, they're they're really technically compared to Frank and Juliet, they're not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> no. At least yeah. Yeah. And he they were pretty lenient with her. Like she opened that box, she played the game and they're like, You lead us to him. And they lay they sat and they waited. They didn't do anything until he revealed himself as Frank and then they popped up with the crew guy's shadow. Yeah, but then they still tried to get her too. Well, he did say maybe. <laughs> you know, he one thing maybe. that I think George is really missing in his worldview for Hellraiser, and I think had you not been meeting Pinhead this coming weekend, I probably would have waited on Hellraiser to show you another movie from a few years earlier, starring one Fred Krueger. Mm. The, mm. the Freddy Krueger effect on the market in the U.S. in the 80s pushes everybody supernatural. As those right. movies get fantastical pretty much from the jump, but definitely by four, I mean, you're just in this kind of comic booky, strange, anti-hero nonsense slasher world where it's like, sort of like Jason, sort of like Michael, but like, <laughs> he has a smart mouth and you're cheering for him sometimes. <laughs> we're, we're at a point where a child molester, they have children's costumes of a child molester. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's that's, a child murderer per the text, but, like, he's supposed to be a bad guy. Why do people like him? Yeah. Y'all are weird. I'm not on Team Freddy. Sorry. I just, like, I liked him. Uh, I didn't even like him from one. I liked him from two. And then that was my favorite Freddy, part two. I like one and two. I don't like three. Everybody likes three. I don't love it. We're spoiling three George. just kind of opened it up a little bit. I don't know. It, well, we're keeping it light. Uh, I don't think I've seen a good Freddy yet. Well, you've only seen the, Freddy versus Jason, the right? Freddy versus Jason right. is a pretty good Freddy. Though. It's a good Freddy. Yeah, yeah. Temper your expectations. That's one of the better Freddies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New Nightmare is a good Freddy, and obviously one and two. Can we get a shout out for the remake? No. Wow. I actually really no? I I liked it. Did you? Yeah, because he was gross and scary, and I didn't want to like him. And I think the reason a lot of people that didn't like it, they went in like, oh, finally we're going to get Freddy. Oh, gross. Oh, gross. What have I done with my life liking this character? Mm. I don't like this movie. I like the other movies. I think that was the arc. See, I think with the story, the story would have been fine with me. It was the visual. He looked like... They they went to... Um, Dark Realistic Knight. on the burns. <laughs> yeah, they no, went... his burns. It was like a Batman Begins kind of thing. Everything's real yeah. now. Yeah. He kind of looked like a mix between Gary Oldman's character in Hannibal and, like, Groot. <laughs> Groot. Like, Freddy... I like the pizza face better. I don't... I don't I'm not it's a big because fan it's of more this. fun. Like, it's not fun to look at, like, No, it just looks more maniacal. Uh, like, the, to have all your features burned off, it, it doesn't give you any... There's nothing to play with visually. Like... Like Chatter Guy? No, he even had more definition than the remake Freddy. Picture somebody who's like had real burns. Like a, someone has third degree burns on 95% of their body. And that's what Freddy in the remake looked like. Like he had no ears. He had no, like everything was just melted, like two holes for his nose. Mm -hmm. 
it just it almost looks sad. Like I'm like, ugh, it made me think of real people that have been burned. So I, I don't know. I might like that. I, didn't I like think it. George might like that one. If that's his story, then I think the well, more realistic might oh, be the way to go. Man, but man, I can't wait till we watch some nightmare movies. I don't know. I I'd, I'd have to I'd have to see both and compare. Although I do like a villain that I can root for. So I don't know. Hmm. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you might need a different franchise then, bro. Yeah. But I mean, don't don't force your opinions on other people because I mean, he might like Freddy. He might be all about that child murderer, which they don't really show. They just talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good backstory. It's disturbing and it's a good villain. I can't. I don't know why it's for. on the lunchbox, but it's a good. It villain. It should not be on the lunchbox. But I was I was a kid from the eighties, so I kind of I bought some of that shit. But when I got older and I realized that there were kids walking around in that costume and I'm like, holy shit, like this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of kids walking around in, in chatter Cenobite outfits. I've seen a lot of pinheads. I think that's what I'm going to be for Halloween this year. Chatter. Some chatter. Out there. I mean, get get after it, I guess. <laughs> I'm just going to wear that. You do you, bro. You know that game, <laughs> that game where you put that... That uh, I really got to be careful what I say. Uh, that plastic thing that holds your lips open, and you have to like say words. Oh, the gross like and dental appliance game that I yeah, refuse to play. Have to, it's so gross. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, it, it never it's never a fun play game, it. Though. <laughs> but I might buy one of those just to have that for my Chatterbox costume. There you go. That's his name now, Chatterbox, not just Chatter. I don't. I Chatters. think isn't that the one where you have to wear it somewhere else? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's chattering exactly? Ooh. Oof. Are we watching Ouch. Teeth? Guys, anybody Ouch. down to watch Teeth? No. I like that one. Teeth? Never mind. Julie would like that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Mm. Oh, my gosh. So um, what have we learned from this movie? What have I learned from yeah, this movie? Yeah, what have you learned from it? Like, is there anything you take from it? Like you said, sometimes the the movie is just a visual um, event, roller coaster event, mm-hmm. and there's no story really. Although I miss that. The story's there. It's no, just no, not I solid. miss. I miss. Yeah, I, I think miss what happened the... was it's kind of what what happens with Stephen King books that get converted in the movie sometimes. Mm-hmm. Because he's such a good author and his books are so scary thick mm-hmm. and full of detail, kind of like Dickens, like he got paid by the the words, so mm-hmm. everything was just over descriptive. Mm-hmm. His books are better than the movies because directors can't, they can't touch his his imagination. Yeah. Also, he probably he probably describes his characters in his books not outright by describing them. Right. You know, he probably describes them by their actions. They probably say things that mean lots of things. Right. And when you're reading the dialogue, you get that. Right. And you visualize And it's in your hundreds own mind. of pages of mm-hmm. that. And I think Barker's the same way. Yeah. So I'm assuming his book about this story is probably fantastic. Probably so full of detail that they, they missed. Yeah, probably. So when you, they're like, we just need to make this movie because we need to, you know, horror is really big now, blah, 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 and visually it would be awesome. And then they missed out on probably the nuances that are in the actual story. Absolutely. Actually, I've got a passage from the book right here. Um, Let me see. The hooks flew through the air and hit the latex-colored skin and pulled the obviously fake skin up. Oh, nope. No, they nailed it. it. That's movie not in it. the book. Right Stop. off the top. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> It's like bubble gum, kind of like the 3M blood. <laughs> hey, I saw a group on uh, on the Facey Bookie this week saying that if you turn your TV to black and white mode, I didn't even know that was a thing, but if you can do that, Dawn of the Dead looks like a direct continuation of Night of the Living Dead, and the blood looks better, and the zombies aren't blue. I'm sure it does. I might sure try that this weekend. Better. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Thank you, Facey Bookie. <laughs> I will, I do want to say, 
I don't know anything about Clive Barker's relationship with Italian horror. So hmm. I don't know what this guy's deal is. I'm not that familiar with a lot of his work. He probably wouldn't tell you about it anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there is an Argento movie from the early 80s uh, called Inferno that is very much this same kind of like walking, living nightmare stuff kind of makes sense. The word they throw around is dream logic, right? Like mm. it doesn't make any sense if you try to analyze it like George, but if you just go with it, yes, it makes sense because it's how your nightmare would progress. Very much like some scenes in this movie. Not sure if Barker just kind of has a same, similar kind of thing going on or if he's familiar with, you know, Inferno. Uh, later, uh, a fellow named John Carpenter JC. made a movie called Prince of Darkness, which he is actually attributed to his attempt at making kind of a batshit crazy like Dario Argento would make, you know? So uh, he's come out and said that. And, and when you watch Prince of Darkness, it, it feels like Inferno. And they both kind of feel like this movie where it's like, it's the experience of watching, not necessarily the analytical, you know, uh, plot and narrative device situation. Can I say just one last thing about this movie? The Jesus jump scare. Awesome. Made me feel <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> just because. Jesus made you jump? Because <laughs> you're jumping for Jesus? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, holy fuck. I'm like, oh, it's just Jesus. <laughs> Thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. Did you say, oh, Jesus? Yeah, Thank Dad what you're happened? here. <laughs> you're like, Dad, you're here. No, like, uh. it was a good jump scare. It was really good. Yeah, because ironically, that happens two seconds later with a dead body. Yeah. <laughs> like, full of maggots. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty just funny. Just the fact that it was Jesus made me feel. Jumping Jesus. I was just like, oh, Jumping that's Jesus. Just, did you say that? <laughs> how did they get me? Maybe that's where it came How did from. they get me with a Jesus? <laughs> uh, that's an accomplishment. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> oh, spoiler alert. There's a Jesus jump scare. <laughs> now you guys got me yeah. thinking, like, am I nostalgic for not this movie, but just that style of filmmaking? To the point that I, like Travis, am letting this movie get away with things that I normally wouldn't? Hmm. Yes, probably. Damn it, self-reflection. Well, the fact that you despise 12 Monkeys and 12 Monkeys tries to do what this movie does and play with your realities and your, you know, what's real, what's not, what's this, what's that. And I think 12 Monkeys did it better than this movie. Ooh. Never mind. This is my personal hell. Talking about Twelve Monkeys in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I honestly, you take Pinhead out of this movie. Yes, put him in that other take, movie. It'd be better. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you take Pinhead out of this movie, it's terrible. Even though it has everything in it that it needs to be a good movie. But I'm saying universally, Pinhead would make Twelve Monkeys more watchable. Pinhead would make anything more watchable. Clerks. You put Pinhead and Clerks? Oh, I think what he's saying is that... <laughs> 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 you might run into Pinhead in a, in a to come in today. convenience store in New Jersey. <laughs> How amazing would it be? <laughs> I'll take this trident. Yeah, seriously. He just walks into the store <laughs> to get cigarettes, and it's seriously like, <laughs> you you rang the box, and I came. <laughs> and I came. Only it's like poorly <laughs> delivered, because you guys are mean to that movie. Because it's a Clerks movie, right? <laughs> oh. He's going to be like, and I came. You rubbed the box, and I came. <laughs> and may he would, he would may emphasize I please, the word came. May I please have it's Kevin a... It's Smith. That's a very good point. <laughs> may I please have a wood tip black and mild? <laughs> no, no, no. That's the filter tip. <laughs> I would like a wood tip black. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Now I want to see <laughs> Jay as, like, the chatterbox guy. <laughs> Silent Bob, of course. Schmookity dukes. We know who Silent Schmookity Bob would play. And then who who would be the girl with the, the gross throat? We gotta. Well, that's gotta be the uh, really annoying girlfriend. That sucked 27 dicks. That sucked. She's got a dick in her, 37. Ma- in her throat. <laughs> 37? Uh, no, I said 27. 37. Yeah, but it's what 37. Is it 37? It's 37. No, whatever. Significant throat damage. All right, let's remake Clerks with all the characters from Hellraiser. <laughs> I, let's do it. Our makeup budget just like spiked. I don't know. 
Uh, but it has to be. Can you imagine the video store scene where like Pinhead sees a picture of himself on the rack? Yes, like that would be awesome. I want to yes. see the Pinhead scene. I want to see this, where he's in the video store while Randall's on the phone ordering pornography, and he's like, "Oh, please, would you also order?" And then he says something so vile that Randall is shocked <laughs> and like drops the phone. Uh, like, <laughs> on a I want to see. <laughs> I want to see. I want to see. You could just beep it because we, we almost made it to the. We almost made it. I want to see. <laughs> Every time you bleep anything, it's no, just funny. This but is seriously, why we can't like, go live. Wouldn't, wouldn't Julia? Wouldn't Julia make a great like? Remember that that lady that was like, "You're not even listening," and he's like, "He's like, I don't yes. like your ruse." Yeah, that's <laughs> Julia. I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, we didn't even talk about his delivery. Like, Which? <laughs> the, the Frank, when he was like bone Frank, mm-hmm. mus- muscle showing Frank. Yeah. His, he's like Shakespearean. Oh, Everything God, he yes. says is just very exact. Like yeah. every word is important. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was like, how oh will do that to you? You could tell that was, that was directed. Like, yeah. I don't know why that was the choice. You know what that first version of Frank made me think? I wasn't sure if this guy was coming back to life, like, reverse decomposing, mm. or if he was being built from the inside out. I think he was being built from the inside out. Right. But at yeah. that point in the movie, I'm like, I don't think your insides look gray like that. Like, he looked like Groot he at looked, that point. He, you've never seen the movie Cocoon, but he looked like the aliens in Cocoon. <laughs> like It's just like... Like and that was supposed to be bone, I think, and it was spongy, and it moved with his mouth. Like you got to do what Rick Baker did with with uh with uh Meatloaf, you know, his friend in the Meatloaf. yeah uh, Jack. Ah yes yes yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. you got to do the skeleton. It's you got to see skull parts. Yes. You can't see these yes. spongy pieces yes. latex. I agree, <sighs> but Pinhead's cool. Pinhead, Pinhead's really cool. <laughs> Listen. Well, I think we should probably pick a movie for next week that George will actually get what he hopes for, you know? A little bit more muscly yeah. bikers in black, trench oh, coats it. and machine guns. <laughs> and chaps. <laughs> oh, chaps. So <laughs> many chaps. Can I tell you guys a Mad Max chaps story real quick? Mm. I like Mad Max. I've been on a George Romero kick lately. Trying mm-hmm. to catch up on all the stuff I hadn't watched. And so I, I happened across Night Riders with a K. Mm. Have you heard of Night Riders? Yes. George hasn't. Uh I assumed No. Of because course it's not. people dressed as knights riding motorcycles on the cover of the movie, <laughs> that it was some post apocalyptic bullshit movie and I was gonna hate it. Turns out it's Glow, the Netflix show. Only for, instead of pro wrestling, it's guys who do, like, renaissance fests Mm. jousting on motorcycles. Hmm. It was awesome. So it's kind of ahead of its time. Oh, it was so good. It was The Wrestler, the movie, but with motorcycles. It was awesome. Highly recommended for anyone who's got time, because it's, like, two hours and 20 minutes. It's a little long. It doesn't feel long, though. And it's, like, all the same, like, backstage politicking you see in a wrestling movie, Mm. but with motorcycles. And Tom Savini. And Tom Savini's in it. And Ed Harris and most of the cast of Dawn of the Dead's in it too. And Stephen King with the MVP performance of the movie. Holy really? moly. Yeah. No, it's even better than Creep Show? Even better than Creep Show. It was real okay. good. Nice. Highly recommend it if you've got a high tolerance for weirdness. Patricia Tallman's in that. She's hot. Patricia Tallman from uh uh the remake of Night of the Living Dead, the one who plays Barbara. Okay. And She's the stunt that. double of Laura Dern in Jurassic Park. Oh. That's yeah. Right. Weird. That's weird, wild, wacky stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I'm excited about the next movie. Which is? Night Riders. What? Night Riders. <laughs> <laughs> uh not with uh not the old T V show. So we're going to uh I think we're going to watch a movie that you've been wanting to watch. Okay. We've tortured you enough without the box. What is the movie you've been wanting to watch? The Shining. We are not watching that. Damn. <laughs> George, this week we will be watching the phenomenal movie by Stanley Kubrick. 
Mmm, I like a Kubrick. The Shining. Stop it, really? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Shining. Yes. Take a few naps. Yeah, I know. Because it's not a boring movie. We need you fresh, bro. But we need you fresh, and it's it's it might be you know the movie you wanted. So you want to watch it rested. Yeah. Sweet. I'm excited. Me too. Have mm. I been talking about The Shining a lot? Oh my god! Since we started, you mention it a lot. <laughs> a lot. I hope you don't hate it. Oh my god, that would suck. If oh, like but it'd be good it. radio. Yeah, I mean, in the end, like. Oh my god. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, I'll send you another Simpsons clip when it's over. So you have that to look <laughs> forward to if you don't like the movie. Sounds good. Sweet. All right. Thank you for joining us on the Remedial Film Class Podcast. If you found us on YouTube, you can also find us on all major podcatchers. And if you found us on Apple or Spotify or Stitcher or Amazon, we're also on YouTube. And we usually throw a little extra in on the video. So check it out if you haven't already. We're also available on Twitter at, at Remedial Film Pod. Also on Instagram at Remedial Film Pod. And you can email us at remedialfilmpod at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash remedialfilmpod. And while you're there, don't forget to join the extra credit discussion group at groups slash remedialfilmpod, where you can chastise George for not realizing that Hellraiser was a pinhead movie. We'll see you back next week for Stephen King's classic, Stanley Kubrick's awesome, Jack Nicholson's fantastic. Guys, that's a pretty darn good movie. <gasps> The Shining.